Hi everyone, this is Eric Bond, the founder of Beat the GMAT, and welcome to tonight's webinar, which is called, How Do I Finance My MBA? I'm sure that's a question that you've asked yourself many times, <laughs> which is why you're here. Tonight, uh, we have some wonderful co-hosts for this session. We have the team behind uh, W.P. Carey's School of Business at Arizona State University, uh, the missions as well as the financial services team here. And uh, believe it or not, uh, this is actually one of the most top requested sessions from the BTGMAC community over the last year. Uh, it seems that financial aid can, um, can be like a black box to many of us, but today we have uh, great experts from the WP Carey School of Business to help demystify the subject. Uh, so just going through the structure for tonight's webinar, uh, it's pretty simple. We are going to, in a moment, hand it off to our guest speakers, Janelle McClellan, as well as Karen Winters, who will go through a presentation uh, walking us through their perspectives of the financial aid process. After the presentation, we're going to ask Janelle and Karen to stick around so that they can participate in a live Q&A session with our community members. So if you have a question about financial aid that you'd like to pose to Janelle and Karen uh, during the session, during the Q&A, uh, you can enter your question into the chat box area right here on the GoToWebinar platform. It should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. Our team will be reviewing the questions as they come in. And once the Q&A starts, uh, I'll be jumping back onto the audio to pose your questions to our featured experts for tonight. So why don't I introduce our speakers? Uh, the first is uh, Janelle McClelland. Uh, she's a member of the admissions and recruiting team at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business, uh, serving as a recruiter for the school's full-time MBA program. Before joining the W.P. Carey MBA program, Janelle worked in uh, student recruitment for the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. Janelle has also worked in student recruiting for University of Arkansas and New Mexico State University and was an international student coordinator for a college in New Zealand. Janelle is originally from Arkansas where she earned her bachelor's degree from Henderson State University and a master's degree in higher education from the University of Arkansas. So welcome Janelle. And uh, our second speaker is Karen Winters, uh, who manages the MBA Financial Services offices at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. Karen is originally from Northern California, actually very close to where the BTG office is right now, and moved to Arizona nine years ago. Uh, she's been advising students in financial aid for the past six years and enjoys helping students simplify the process and graduate with as little debt as possible, which is music to my ears. Prior to joining the W.P. Carey MBA program, uh, Karen worked for Maricopa Community Colleges and Northern Arizona University. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree, in fact, from Northern Ar Arizona University in exercise science. And I love this part of her uh, bio. She, she describes, um, she says, think of her as your personal trainer as you work out a great financial aid plan and properly stretch your money. Uh, it sounds like we have some fantastic experts this evening to help us understand how we can finance our MBA degrees. So um, that being said, I think we're ready to get started. So Janelle, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Eric. Again, everyone, this is Janelle McClelland, and I want to congratulate you all on deciding to attend this webinar tonight, as well as for making the decision to pursue your MBA. This is a very exciting time, as you all are gearing up for round one applications. And at this time, I want to have you all think about some of your opportunities as you plan to pursue your MBA. And so one of the things that you all should be giving consideration to is the prestige factor when looking at MBA programs. What we mean by prestige is looking at top rankings. Where does the program that you want to study fall within those national rankings? Also things you want to consider are the rigorous curriculum that you will be studying. And so You'll want to talk to faculty, find out about their classes, see if your faculty are going to be innovators and have influential research as well as consulting experiences, and two, see what real-world experience your faculty will bring to the table. Those are all things that fall under prestige. Another thing you want to give consideration to is the flexibility of your MBA program. It's my understanding that most of you in this webinar tonight are considering a full-time MBA program, and that's great. Sometimes life gets in the way, though, and you need to have a backup plan. 
are the MBA programs that you're considering offered in a variety of formats. One of those formats could be the online MBA or a weekend or evening program. Again, you just want to have a backup in place so that if something happens, you don't get off track and lose your place um, while pursuing your MBA. Another area of flexibility to consider are what elective opportunities are available for you to study. Are there international opportunities? If you want to study abroad, will that be a possibility? What specializations and areas of emphasis are available for you to choose from? And then finally, are any dual degrees available in terms of being able to get more bang for your buck as you study for your MBA? All of those things fall under flexibility. Another thing to consider as you pursue your MBA is looking at the community that you'll be involved in. Look at class size. Will you be sitting in a large auditorium where the professor may or may not know your name? Or will you be in a more intimate environment where professors will know you on a first name basis? Another thing to consider is what area of the country will you be situated in? Are you a person who's impacted by the weather? And so think about the physical community that you'll be involved in as well. Will your MBA program offer a variety of clubs and organizations so that you can get leadership experience to put on your resume? That's another part of community that you need to consider. And then finally, what does the alumni network at your top school look like? So you can give consideration to networking not only while you're pursuing your MBA, but also post-MBA and beyond. And then finally, what support opportunities are available to you? Pursuing an MBA can be an overwhelming time, and you need to have support not only through the admissions experience, but also the Student Services and Career Management Center side of these things. And so in terms of thinking about support, what is the staff to student ratio at these schools you're considering? And so again, all of these parts of consideration lead to one larger consideration when looking to earn your MBA. And that larger consideration is value. We define that as what you get versus what you pay. And so all MBA programs are going to have a cost associated with them what you really want to know and to uncover is the value within your program. Again, we talk about consideration. Will you be attending a public or a private university? What does that look like in terms of the institution's culture as well as the price for attending that university? Will you be considered an in-state resident or an out-of-state resident? Will that school waive your residency to an in-state resident if you are not automatically considered so. And then another consideration will be your cost of program. And be sure that you're comparing apples to apples here. And what we mean by that is look comprehensively not only at the program tuition and program fees, but what are the living expenses associated with the area that you'll be studying, what are the costs of textbooks, so on and so forth, so that you are truly comparing programs equally. Another thing to think about is that you will want to know what are your takeaways going to be? What skills and knowledge are you going to learn to be able to accomplish not only your personal goals, but your professional goals? And that is overall going to be the return on investment that you have for earning your MBA. So again, cost is going to vary quite a bit among top-ranked MBA programs. And so at this time, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Karen Winters, who can share with you information on how to fund your MBA. Thank you, Janelle. So for the next part of this, we are going to go through different opportunities you have to fund your MBA. <clears throat> Some of these items that we are going to cover are going to be the federal student aid aspect, private educational loans, uh, if you're a veteran, potentially how you can use your veteran benefits. If you're interested in funding the MBA yourself, some of your self-funding options. And then also scholarships, different things to look for as you are looking at these scholarships. 
So the big question is, what is financial aid? A lot of people will call up an institution and say, can you please tell me your options on financial aid? And when they're actually calling up, they're actually specifically calling to ask about scholarships. Financial aid is actually a whole conglomerate of things. Essentially, financial aid is just the funds that you use to assist you with the cost of your education. These, can, these things can include federal student aid, which includes loans and grants, scholarships and fellowships, assistantships, as well as state grants. One thing that I do want to note here for you guys is, unfortunately, as a graduate student, you will not be eligible for the majority, or you will not be eligible for federal grants, and typically not even grants at the state level. So just keep an eye on that when you are calling up to talk to your institution about financial aid. So first we're going to talk about federal student aid, and these are some of the general eligibility requirements. So some of the things that you need to think about as you are doing your research on financial aid. Are you a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident? If so, that's the very first thing you need, one of the very first uh, eligibility requirements for federal student aid. Do you have previous student loans? And if so, are you in good standing on all those student loans? Meaning that you are paid up to date, you don't have any loans that are in default at that time. If you do have loans in default, unfortunately that does mean you are ineligible for federal student aid. So make sure you get those loans out of default as soon as possible. Are you under the lifetime loan limits for graduate students? Essentially this means that you are eligible to receive up to $138,500 in all loans which would be the subsidized and unsubsidized loan. This does not include the grad plus loan. Um, but are you up to that limit? If you're up to that limit, unfortunately, the, the school will not be able to offer you many loans in the federal loan area. Uh, are you under the lifetime limit for the subsidized loans as well, which is $65,500? As long as you're underneath that, you should be fine. You should be eligible for financial aid. Are you degree seeking? If you are going into an MBA program, you will be degree seeking, so you don't ever have to worry about that. And then the last thing is, are you registered at least half time? Federal aid, you are not eligible for it if you are not registered at least in five credit hours in each semester. Five credit hours is what's considered half time for a graduate student. They do look at that as a per semester basis. So some schools will actually enroll you on a quarter or a trimester or on some other sort of system but they look collectively at a whole, as a whole at this semester. So just as long as you're registered in those five credit hours. In a full-time program, you will likely be registered in five credit hours in every single semester that you plan on attending that program. So how do you apply for federal student aid? The very first thing, this is a, actually a brief overview. What you're going to do is complete the free application for federal student aid. That's also known as the FAFSA. And then the school will likely request documentation from you, and you are going to want to go ahead and submit that. And then once you see your award offer, you're going to want to just take a look and make sure you understand it. Complete all the loan documents that, it's asked, that the school's asked for, and then after that you can receive your disbursement. So we're going to dive into each of these little bits and pieces a little bit more in depth so that you guys know what you can expect as you go through the application process for the federal student aid. So the very first thing is completing the FAFSA. You do want to complete this online by going to www.fafsa.ed.gov. Make sure you go to fafsa.ed.gov and not fafsa.com. What you will find is that fafsa.com charges you $75 to complete your FAFSA when it's actually a free application. So if you are completing the FAFSA and all of a sudden somebody asks you to go ahead and enter your credit card number, Exit out of that website and make sure you go to fafsa.ed.gov. One of the great things about the FAFSA is you can actually put up to 10 school codes into the FAFSA. This way, when you are looking at your schools, all these different schools can actually get you awarded financial aid as long as you've been admitted to their program. And then you can make your decision on which school is offering you the best offer between your scholarships and your loans. Uh, the next thing that you want to make sure you do once you complete your FAFSA is electronically sign it with your personal identification number. That's also known as the PIN. Again, you're going to want to make sure you go to the pin.ed.gov website and don't go to pin.com or any of those other websites that you may find out there. Essentially what this does is it just says, I agree to all the information that I have submitted under this FAFSA and I'm going to go ahead and submit this to the schools of my choice. 
You do have the opportunity to request a duplicate if you do not remember what your FAFSA is, if you did use one, sorry, what your PIN is, if you did use one as an undergraduate student. So just keep an eye out on that website and make sure you're going to the correct area when you do go, or go to request your personal identification number. Once all this is done, the FAFSA is then sent to the government for review. The government does not award you your loans. A lot of students do think that the government has taken your FAFSA and determined exactly how much and what type of aid you are eligible for. They don't actually do that. When you send this to the government, what they do is they calculate your expected family contribution, also known as the EFC. This number does come into play sometimes when scholarships are awarded and when certain loans are awarded as well. Once the government has gone ahead and reviewed the information that you have submitted to them, they will then go ahead and send the results to the schools that you chose, any of those 10 schools that you chose. Again, just keep in mind that this FAFSA does not, or the government does not determine the type of aid or amount you are eligible to receive, but what they will do is they will send you this nice little email to your student aid report, and that student aid report oftentimes will come back and say, sorry, you're not eligible for certain types of financial aid. Please don't let that scare you. That is essentially telling you you're not eligible for grants. The school will actually determine how much you are eligible to receive and the type of financial aid you want to receive. So once the FAFSA is submitted to the school, what's the next thing that happens? So once you're actually admitted, the financial aid department can then finally see the results that you included into your FAFSA. So they may, at that point in time, after reviewing your information, determine that they need to request additional documentation from you. This documentation may be used to verify information on your FAFSA or resolve any conflicting information from something that you may have included on the FAFSA. Don't be alarmed if they do request this documentation from you. It's just federal regulation that they need to review certain items when, uh, when the FAFSA is received. Uh, timing really is everything when it comes down to this. Submit your documentation early, very early in the process. So as soon as they do ask you for documentation, you do want to make sure that you submit it. Some schools are so large that it does take them quite some time to get through the information that's submitted, and they have to review all the information that you are turning in on a case-by-case -case scenario. So you will do want to make sure everything is submitted early so that way your loans are awarded when you are trying to decide which school that you want to attend. So once you receive your loan offer, what you want to do is review it very, very closely. You'll notice that when schools offer you financial aid, they're going to offer you quite a bit more than what the cost of your tuition is. The reason why they do this is they want to make sure that you have enough money for living expenses should you need it. Especially if you're looking into a full-time program, you may find out that you need some additional expenses for living. What I do always recommend to you, though, is please only borrow what you need. We have a lot of students that will come through here and say, I think I'm going to go ahead and take out all of this just in case. And when that, what ends up happening is they take all that money and then they end up spending it. And then at the end of the day, they come back and they need to make that payments on, those payments on it. And they don't realize really how much that turns out to be in the end. If you don't need it, please don't borrow it. So when you see your loan offer to you, you will see that you will receive a combination of the Federal Stafford Unsubsidized Loan and the Graduate Plus Loan. These are the two types of most common loans that you will see offered to you. The unsubsidized loan, the maximum amount you can receive is up to $20,500 per academic year. The interest rate on this loan is 6.8% and interest does accrue immediately upon disbursement. And there's no credit check required with this loan. So this loan, when you see it offered to you, it is guaranteed to you. The Graduate Plus loan, you will find this is offered up to your cost of attendance minus any other aid received. Received. So this loan is that loan that when you do need those living expenses, this is the loan you're going to end up dipping into to help you out with those living expenses. The interest rate on this loan is 7.9% and it, in, it accrues immediately upon disbursement. This loan does have a credit check associated with it. Some schools will make you go through a credit check before you ever even see the offer of this loan, and some other schools will actually offer this loan to you, and when you accept the loan, that's when it goes off for the credit check. So just make sure whatever school you are deciding to go to, that when it comes to the Graduate Plus loan, you know if your credit has been approved when it's been offered, or if you need to get it approved after it's been offered. Both of these loans, 
actually you do not need to worry about making payments on them until six months after you graduate or drop below half-time enrollment. It's important that I put that drop below half-time enrollment out there for you guys so that you understand if something happens and you need to step away from the program for a semester or for a year or something like that, please do know that you will likely enter repayment on both of these loans during that period of time. Uh, a lot of people often think that it's just based on the graduation date, but it's not. It's based on your level of enrollment. If your program does not enroll you to be, does not require you to be enrolled over the summer, don't worry. Summer is not a long enough period for it to kick you into repayment, so you will always stay in deferment for that summer period. So once you've decided the loans that you want to take out, you will have some loan documents that you need to. Uh, complete. A couple of these, two of these documents are the master promissory note and the entrance counseling. The master promissory note is essentially just your promise to repay the loan and you'll need to do two different MPNs if you do an unsubsidized loan and a grad plus loan. They're two different loans with different uh, credit term or different terms I should say on the loans so you do need to make sure that you are completing the correct MPNs for the correct loans. Generally this lo this process does only need to be done once during the time that you're in the program, but please know that there are some things that could happen while you are in the program that could have you complete them a second or third time. The entrance counseling is essentially just a quiz that informs you of all the loan details. It's extremely important that you complete this. This way you understand the loans that you're getting into. You understand the repayment options. You understand just everything about this loan before you actually take it out. There are some students who don't quite understand what they're getting into with their loans, and so what they do is they look at this entrance counseling and realize, uh-uh, I actually don't want to take all this loan money. And then they'll come back to us and say, hey, can we decrease our loan now that they have that better understanding of the loan. So these loan documents that you need to complete may seem a little bit like, why do I need to do this? But they are extremely important because they really help you understand what you're getting yourself into with your loans, um, with the amount of loans that you're actually taking out. So the loan disbursement is always a big question. How does this happen? Every school is going to be different. The earliest any school can actually disperse loans is going to be 10 days before the semester starts. This becomes really important because when you're looking at buying books, there's a good chance that depending on the school that you go to, you may actually need to buy the books first. And then once your loans get dispersed to you, essentially reimburse yourself with that money. There's other schools out there that actually disperses late as halfway through the semester. So again, keep an eye out on the disbursement date of the school that you are deciding to go to because this really can affect those initial moving costs and those initial school costs because you don't have that loan money just yet. With your loan disbursement, the other good thing to remember is that it is, only, that it is applied directly to your tuition balance first. There aren't many schools out there anymore, if any, that will give you the money and ask you to pay the school with that money. They will always apply it to your balance first, and then if you accept more than what you actually owe on your account, then you'll get a refund. The refunds are nice because that's what helps you with your living expenses. So if you, if you go back to where I was talking about the general eligibility requirements, I did mention that you do need to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. If you are not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you will not be eligible for those student loans. Some of your options for funding are going to be for you to go with a demand draft. Essentially, this is just money from your home country that has been turned into U.S. currency, and it's essentially kind of like a little check that you can just give to the university that you decide to attend. You can also look for a loan from your home country. Uh, a lot of the loans from home countries do end up dispersing the funds um, directly to you and not to the school. So make sure that you understand how the loan money works from your home country. All countries disperse funds a little bit differently. The other option is you can always look to see if you can find a private educational loan in the U.S. The big thing about this, though, is please remember or please know that you do need to have a U.S. citizen as a co-signer on this loan. There is a credit check required on these private educational loans, and so with that credit check, that's why you need to have that U.S. citizen as a co-signer. So since I did mention the private educational loans, we'll talk a little bit more about those now. 
what you'll find is if you actually call up a school, a school is not able to um, provide you with different lenders who would be able to fund a private educational loan. So what you want to do is actually conduct your own research. What I recommend doing is always starting with your bank. There are a lot of banks out there that will actually offer a pretty good deal on interest rates to valued customers. So if you've been with a bank for a period of time, go ahead and check with them and see what kind of deals they may offer you. You could get a discount on an interest rate. You could get a discount on the different fees that they may assess to students. You could get different varied repayment schedules, things like that. When you are looking at private educational loans, though, you do want to take into consideration quite a few things. Is the interest rate variable on this loan? If it is variable, what does it vary up to? Remember, the, private, the federal loans are all fixed interest rates, so even though they may seem a little bit high, they are going to be fixed for the lifetime of the loan. Is there a prepayment penalty on this private educational loan? If so, how much is it? Does it actually outweigh the additional interest that you could be paying? on a federal loan if you are able to pay your loan off early. And then finally, what are the terms of repayment? Repayment is a stressful point in time when you first all of a sudden realize that you're going to have to pay back your loans. So you want to really make sure you understand how long you really have and are they going to be flexible with your terms of repayment. But again, please keep in mind that there is a credit check that is required on all private educational loans. And the loan actually does need to be certified through the school that you attend. You can go ahead and decide to say, okay, I'm going to take out a little bit here in the unsubsidized loan, but then you want to take out a private educational loan for the rest of it. That's absolutely fine. Go ahead and mix and match if that works out best for you. But you cannot exceed your cost of attendance that's set by the school. So that amount that the school decides to give you for living expenses, that's the maximum amount you can actually receive on a and on an academic year basis. So another option for funding your MBA is if you're a veteran. A couple of ways to make sure that you get this uh, that you get your veterans benefits figured out is make sure you contact the Office of Veteran Services. You'll find that some schools have it located in the financial aid office and some schools have this located in the registrar's office. Figure out exactly where they are so that you make sure you contact the right people. Obtain your certificate of eligibility early in the process. Sometimes this can take up to 60 days for you to get this information. So by getting it early on in the process, it keeps that headache from forming as you're getting ready to make those payments on your account. For veterans benefits, uh, quite a bit is going to be funded by these benefits depending on what your eligibility actually is. The maximum eligibility is going to be based on the public school in-state tuition. So depending on the school that you go to, if it's private, you want to make sure you understand that if the tuition exceeds what an in-state tuition person pays at a public school, not everything will be funded. You will actually be receiving a housing allowance too with some of these benefits. The housing allowance is going to be based on your city of residence. The other thing that you want to keep an eye out for is, is your school a Yellow Ribbon program? If it is, make sure that you understand exactly what the Yellow Ribbon program does and they can, uh, they can all help you out with the Veteran Services Department. Another option for you is if you decide that you are going to go ahead and self-fund this program. What you want to do is make sure that you talk to your school and understand if they have a tuition installment plan that's set up for you so that rather than paying everything up front, you can actually pay on a month-to-month -month basis if that makes things a little bit easier for you. You can also look at pulling funds from a 401k or another investment account. Before you do this, though, please make sure you speak with your tax professional to understand the implications. Schools are not able to discuss the pros and cons of these different types of investment accounts because majorly this is actually a tax professional's question to answer. Schools aren't able to actually talk to you about taxes period, so it makes it hard for us to be able to talk to you about these kinds of things. The, the final thing that you can do is you may have been saving for a long time in a college savings plan, or maybe your parent did decide to help you out with a college savings plan. You can go ahead and dip into that. Just make sure, again, that you understand what your tax, what your tax liabilities are for this. The last option, not the last, but another option that you have would be scholarships. 
what you'll find is that most full-time MBA programs will offer scholarships to you in varying amounts. So you'll want to make sure that the school that you're applying to, you understand what kind of scholarships they're going to offer you. Many schools do require specific application processes and criteria. So make sure you understand that as well. A lot of these scholarships are going to be awarded on merit and other specific criteria. Different things they may be looking for could be things such as work experience, um, other, other uh, participation that you've had in other organizations and things like that. So make sure you understand what exactly they're looking for when they are trying to award you these scholarships. Keep in mind that you do want to make sure that you're applying to these programs early. They, do, they are awarded on a first come, first serve basis. And the last thing is, is make sure you check, the, check with the schools for the application process and the deadlines. All schools are going to vary in their application process and their deadlines. So you really want to make sure that you understand this. Now that I've talked a little bit about a lot of these general items, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Janelle since she's our admissions representative. And a lot of these scholarships are actually determined by the admissions team. So it's great to hear the admissions perspective on this. Thank you, Karen. An example of a school-specific scholarship is one that I am thrilled to announce for the first time publicly. And that is the William Polk Scholarship Fund at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. When you're looking for the scholarship fund, you'll see that it's new for 2013 applicants and it's designed to recognize the best and brightest students. We are offering substantial merit-based awards with no separate application. The awards will range from cash scholarships and or tuition reductions and will be available for every round. We are encouraging our applicants to apply early, however, and you will see the deadlines listed in front of you. And so for our international applicants, please be aware that round three is our final deadline for you to be considered for admission as well as the scholarship award. But again, we're very excited to announce that, and we do hope to receive your application materials. Other scholarship possibilities to consider are going to be at the university level. As you all are giving consideration to a variety of MBA programs, you'll want to see what university level scholarships they offer. Also, check with the graduate college at each institution. They may offer scholarships that are specific to graduate students, not just MBA students. So be aware of that. And then also research outside sources of scholarship funding. We've listed a few websites for you, so you might want to write those down or come back and look at this webinar at another time. FineAid.org, NextStudent.com, and FastWeb.com are all legitimate scholarship search engines. And the big thing, as Karen mentioned earlier, was not to pay for these services with not paying for your FAFSA, as well as not paying for a scholarship search. These are all legitimate websites where you can find additional resources to fund your MBA. As we conclude here tonight, I want to provide you with some things to continue to look for in your search for your MBA program. Make sure that you're comparing costs before you make your final program selection. And again, look comprehensively. Program tuition, fees, living expenses. What does it all add up to? Does the school that you're planning to attend have a dedicated MBA financial services team to support you and to help you through this process? And then finally, does the school you're considering offer unique MBA scholarship opportunities to help you fund your MBA. Again, the biggest takeaway to have from the presentation tonight is to find that value. What are you paying versus what are you getting in return? And with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Thank you so much to uh, Janelle as well as Karen. Uh, for those of you who might have joined us a little bit late, uh, we've been listening to uh, a presentation by Janelle McClelland, a member of the admissions and recruiting team at Arizona State University's WP Carey School of Business, and Karen Winters, who uh, manages the MB Financial Services office at Arizona State University's 
WP Carey School of Business. Uh, they just walked us through a wonderful analysis and perspective of how we can go about financing our MBA. So at this point, we are ready to take your questions live. Uh, I see that we have about 20 minutes or so uh, where Janelle and Karen will stick around to uh, respond to any questions that you have regarding uh, financial aid and scholarships. So uh, you can post your question in the chat window area right in the GoToWebinar platform and our team is going to be able to review and, um, and uh, deliver those questions to our guests tonight. Uh, you know, so the first question is actually to both Janelle and Karen, and uh, I want to kick things off with a, a meta question that I see all the time within our Beat the GMAT community, uh, and you have sort of addressed this, but I just want to make this super clear. Do I have a better chance of getting a scholarship or getting a better financial aid package if I apply early? Um, you mentioned some things about first come, first serve, but I want to be super clear about do I have a better chance of getting a better uh, financial package by applying early? And uh, uh, Janelle and Karen would love to get both your perspectives on this. Okay, this is Janelle and I'll start. It really can depend on the school in terms of their deadlines. And so I know Karen will go into further detail regarding the financial aid component. In terms of scholarships, it's going to be very specific to each institution. So you'll want to ask those questions directly um, of those institutions that you're giving consideration to. I can speak for WP Carey's School of Business and then knowing that we do have those funds available for each round, but making sure that you have all materials in by the close of each round. So speaking specifically to our program, it, it does matter depending mm -hmm. on what application round you're applying to. But for other schools, I don't want to speak for them, and I would just check with them individually. So this is Karen. When it comes to the general scholarships that you may find at the university level, so if you're looking outside of the business school, the business school, let's say, yes, it is going to be very beneficial for you to get everything done early. A lot of schools are going to have a deadline that you may see out there that's going to be as early as potentially February 15th. I know a lot of schools keep pushing things early. With that, you actually want to make sure you have your FAFSA on file by February 15th, as well as any scholarship applications turned into the general university that you are applying to by that point in time, because that's going to give your, you your best opportunity to get the most scholarship funding. <clears throat> with that said, I do want to notate that with loans, it really doesn't matter when you actually apply to the program. With the loans, you are going to be eligible for loans well into the cycle, but just because the money tends to be the most frustrating and hard part to get together, I would recommend highly getting everything turned in as early as possible so that you can get the funding cleared up and out of the way before you go into everything else. Thanks so much for that perspective. And why don't we go ahead and get into the questions from the audience. Uh, so this first question comes from Angeline. When do you submit your loan application? Should you do this right after you get accepted or even before? Uh, Karen, maybe you can provide perspective on that. Yeah, the FAFSA actually becomes available every January 1st. So depending on when your actual program starts, you'll be able to do it February or January 1st of the year that you are actually starting. So if you decide to start fall 2013, the 2013-2014 FAFSA will become available on January 1st, 2013, and you can complete it at any point in time after that. The earlier, obviously, the better. Uh, one thing that you will find is that you do need to have your taxes filed prior to actually completing the FAFSA. Um, you are also able to complete the FAFSA and indicate will file. So you can estimate your taxes out and then just click will file. That way the school gets all of your information before that potentially as early as February 15th deadline. Great. Uh, Janelle, uh, Dennis has a question about scholarships. Uh, have you, are there any cases where uh, students receive scholarships to cover 100% of tuition. Maybe you can speak from the perspective of uh, W.P. Carey. Yes. To uh, very briefly answer Dennis's question, there are yeah. scholarships available that can cover the entire cost of program. What you'll want to be aware of, though, as we discussed in the webinar, is what other costs are associated. So you might still have living expenses or books left to pay for. However, there 
is funding available that is going to cover um, the entire cost of programs. So just check with the different schools that you're considering. But again, beyond cost of programs such as tuition and fees, are other things covered as well? Okay. Well, uh, Karen, I think this next question is for you. Uh, it's uh, somewhat of a technical question from Taiwo asking, uh, first he's saying, hi, thank you for hosting this. <laughs> uh, and the question is, is the accrued interest on the graduate plus or unsubsidized loan payable during the two years of your program? It definitely is, and actually that's a really good option for you if you are able to make those payments during the program. It, ke it keeps down on the amount that you actually will end up paying overall, which as you know is a very good thing. Um, if you are not able to make the payments, it's absolutely fine. You don't need to worry about that, but if you do want to, you can. The lender will actually send you a biannual statement. You can pay more often if you'd like to, but that biannual statement is just basically that point to indicate that, hey, if you don't make this payment, we are going to compound your interest, which means it gets added to your principal balance. Um, but yes, please feel free to make that payment. And if you are actually paying interest while you are in school, you can continue to actually claim that on your tax returns up to $2,500 a year. That's about the maximum amount of tax advice we can give on our end. <laughs> um, but you can actually claim that, which is really nice for you, so that you get a little bit of a, a help on the back end as well, even though you are making those payments while you're in school. Gotcha. And uh, you know, Weston has a, a really fascinating question too, which is, how does pre-MBA income affect availability of loans and financial aid? Are there things that can be done prior to the FAFSA to increase need? For example, transferring money to your IRA, paying down loans with savings, uh, et cetera. Any thoughts on that? Well, they... When you first enter the MBA, and we run into this quite a bit here with our students, you know, they're typically making pretty good money before they start the program, and then of course once they hit the program, they're not making any money because they're coming to school full time. In order for the university to, any university, to consider uh, a reduction in income, you do have to have this sort of a reduction in income for at least, at least six weeks. Mm -hmm. One thing that I will tell you though is keep an eye out, because actually at this point in time, since the unsubsidized loan is not a need-based loan, the need to actually clear up your income like that is not as, not as much of a priority as it has been in the past. That unsubsidized loan not being a need-based loan, you are going to get that regardless of if you make $2 a year or if you make $2 million a year. That loan is going to be offered to you. Um, if you did want to move some things around just to make yourself look like you needed a little bit more money when it comes to scholarships and things like that, you're more than welcome to, but make sure that you understand, again, those tax implications of what it's like when you do move those funds around. Um, but scholarships are really the big thing that you have to keep an eye out on. Some schools every once in a while will offer you a Perkins loan. That loan does tend to be need-based, so if your school does offer that, you may want to consider trying to reduce your income. But those are going to be given out to those first round of students that do get their application turned in before February 15th if they are awarding that loan. Great. So um, I see a lot of questions coming in from our audience members. Uh, folks, please keep it coming. Uh, I'm very impressed with the quality of the questions coming in. We're clearly challenging our guests here. So uh, uh, getting as every, uh, all the ounces of information we can pull for the remaining uh, 15 minutes for this session. Uh, Janelle, I, I see a question here that perhaps you can respond to from George. Uh, are there any need-based scholarships, and when will schools show applicants their full financial aid packages? In terms of need-based scholarships, yes, schools do offer those, and typically they will use the FAFSA as one of those determining mm -hmm. um, eligibility, um, and so that's how they determine if a student has need or not. So yes, that can be a consideration when looking at scholarships. So can you ask Eric the second part of your question as well? Oh yes, when will school when will school show applicants? or I guess accepted applicants, their financial aid packages? I think that one is probably a little bit better on my end uh, to answer, Eric. So with that one, the full financial aid package is going to be dependent on when loans are actually awarded to. Some schools are going to get your loans awarded very, very early on in the process, and mm -hmm. some schools it's going to be a little bit later in the process. And the reason why you may see it a little bit later in the process is just because with grad students it's very um, – easy to figure out what your loan options are going to be. So for some schools, you may see it as early as March, where you see your entire uh, financial aid package, and in some schools, you may see that it's as late as even July. 
So just understand that, and I'm sure if you ever had any questions, all you had to do is contact the financial aid department and talk to them and ask them what kind of loans you're going to be offered if they're one of those later awarding schools. I see uh, that there are a couple of international folks here uh, in the audience, and, and uh, Bramjo actually is answering, uh, asking a question that's really representative of uh, several themes we're seeing coming in, which is, um, can you talk a little bit more about loan opportunities in the United States for international students? So, for example, the banks in India will loan only to a, a specific amount, which is usually not more than 25% of the fees for uh, MBA programs in the United States. So um, any thoughts, uh, Karen, about, about what international students can do within the United States? Well, I do want to say that we have a lot of students at our school who have actually received their full cost of program, including living expenses. Uh, as as a loan from their home country. So double check on the actual bank that you're looking at in your home country to make sure that you are getting the most correct and up-to-date information from them. I don't know if it changes as a graduate student versus an undergraduate student, but I do have students around here that are, that are receiving the full funding from their home country. Um, in terms of loans in the U.S., again, it comes down to these private alternative loans where you can go to banks and talk to banks or look at other um, lending institutions to see what types of loans that they offer. But unfortunately with all of these you do still need to get a U.S. citizen as a co-signer. So finding loans here in the U.S. for an international student, you do need that U.S. co-signer and I do recommend always starting with a bank. The banks typically have the better products, so always start with those banks. But other than that, the, the, those are going to be the two biggest, the two loan opportunities you have, your home country and then those private banks here, or the banks here in the U.S. Now, uh, Karen, do you have any, uh, are there strategies or even resources for securing a U.S. co-signer if you don't have any contacts within the United States? You know, I've had some students come to me and ask if, you know, we have somebody here who would co-sign. Um, and I do believe that there are some schools out there. I don't know of any off the top of my head, but I do believe that there are some schools out there that will actually um, sponsor students, mm -hmm. I think is what they call it. So they will actually be the ones to co-sign on the loan and say that they'll back the student up, um, things like that. So you'll want to check with the school. I do know here at ASU we don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. Um, but there are some schools out there. I would guess that they're going to be the smaller private schools that will be willing to help students out in terms of sponsoring them so that they can actually get that U.S. citizen co-signer. Right. Okay. Um, so let's see, uh, a lot more questions to go through in, in so little time. Uh, this next one is from, from Steve. Uh, you know, generally, can you speak to how competitive traditional scholarships are to secure as an applicant? Um, maybe, uh, maybe Janelle, you can speak from the perspective of W.P. Carey. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the availability of the scholarships and, and how, you, how competitive it is to, to land one of those scholarships? Absolutely. Competitiveness is going to vary not only year to year, but round to round, because you'll be competing against your peers who have applied for, let's say, round one consideration. So what you need to think about as an MBA applicant is what can you do to put your best foot forward. And so for WP Carey specifically, in terms of building the strongest application that you can, You'll want to look at the essays that are required, look at who is recommending you for a recommendation form, look at your GMAT score. Is that something that you can improve? A lot of things in terms of building your application is already set. Your undergraduate GPA, you can't go back in time and pull yourself up to a 4.0 to be a more competitive applicant. So what are the things that you still have control over? to make yourself a more competitive applicant. So GMAT would be one of those areas, essays, recommenders, things of that nature. Your work experience, what are you bringing to the table in terms of your background with industry? So being able to speak to that and articulate how the MBA is going to help move you forward in your career is going to make you a more competitive applicant, not only for admission, but also for scholarships. So, you know, you, you've mentioned, Janelle, some, that some things are just fixed, like your GPA uh, and, and some other areas of your, of your experiences, but uh, how would your admissions team view uh, maybe someone who's taking supplemental courses 
to uh, compensate for a poor GPA, let's say, in college, uh, you know, there are some certain things that you can be doing uh, even after college to to uh, improve your candidacy. Are, are those um, are those uh, data points also that you consider in the scholarship distribution process? Admissions as well as scholarship considerations, the applicant will be reviewed comprehensively, and so as long as he or she will bring to light these extra steps that have been taken to address perhaps weaknesses um, that could be perceived in the application, and you know, taking these actions to remedy that and to show commitment to improving and dedication to getting into an MBA program, that will all be taken under consideration, certainly. Wonderful. Uh, Karen, going, going back to you, I see a question from Sarah that you may be able to respond to. Uh, the question is, for the loans that require a credit check, uh, are they lo just looking for the status of prior student loans, or is it based on other items on the credit report? It is actually going to be based on other items on the credit report as well. It's going to be your entire credit history that they that the direct loans will actually look at, that the government looks at when they're determining uh, if you're eligible for this loan or not. So there are a couple of things to watch out for. If you do have a foreclosure within the last four years, that is actually unfortunately guaranteed denial on that loan. But I can tell you that even a bankruptcy doesn't guarantee denial. So it kind of depends on where you come from if you do have that bankruptcy. They're going to look to see how many past due charges you have on your account, different things like that. They are going to also look at your debt to income, um, which that does change, of course, once you get into school. So they don't look at it too, too closely. But of course, they don't want to pull up your, your credit and then find out you've got a ton of debt and you're only taking on more. So they do look at different things like that. You do have the opportunity to, opportunity to appeal denials if you do have one, but they will review your entire credit history. Gotcha. And again, that's only for the Grad Plus loan, too. That's not going to be for the unsubsidized loan or any other loans that the school offers you. It's just going to be that Grad Plus loan. Simon has a question. Uh, can you receive stipends or tuition credits while in school for signing up as a TA or other mentorship capacities that benefit the university? So I've seen this model very um, commonly in the undergraduate level. Uh, any thoughts on, on whether this applies for MBA programs, too? Yes, this is Janelle. And it will vary from school to school if they offer graduate assistantships. Some schools will give you a stipend that you earn, let's say, for working 10 hours per week with one of the academic departments within the School of Business. Um, other schools could offer you a reduction to in-state tuition uh, prices. So there are a variety of ways that a graduate assistantship can be utilized to lower the cost that you pay for an MBA, as well as to give you some money in hand with the stipend opportunities that they provide. Yeah, so the, the graduate assistantship, or as some other schools may call it, a tuition, a tu sorry, a teaching assistant or even a resident assistant, you may find that they will actually provide you a pretty good waiver and then that, uh, that stipend to assist you with additional living expenses. Um, for all schools, you are going to want to look to see if either the business school offers it up front or if you need to do your own research and see if there's maybe something on the school's website to see if you can find that opportunity out there. Great. Uh, Karen, uh, one clarification. This is a pretty important one from Arun. Uh, the veterans' benefits that you covered um, are only for U.S. Army veterans. Is that correct? So international veteran applicants are not eligible for some of those benefits. Is that um, correct? And I, I do want to clarify, though, it's not just Army. It's all military. Um, but yes, it is going to be for the U.S. military people, um, the domestics, I should say. If you are eligible for benefits in your own country, we can always talk further to see if you may be able to utilize them here, but it's probably going to be based on where you actually served your time and if they will actually allow you to use it in a different country. Okay, well, uh, I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. So uh, th this next question is from Roxanne. Uh, student loan rates are high. So would it be better to get a home equity line of credit if I currently own a condo? If so, what would be the process? Sort of, uh, I guess, your opinion uh, than Karen or Janelle about, you know, uh, home equity line, lines of credit. Is that, is that a common way of financing MBA educations that you know of? Um, I don't typically recommend it. 
Of course, if this, is, if this seems like it's going to be the better option for you, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. But one of the things that you want to think about is with that home equity line of credit, you immediately start paying that. So if you're in a position where you aren't going to be able to be making those additional payments on a monthly basis, um, that may not be the best opportunity for you with that loan. Um, and that's even though that the federal loans do tend to have a higher interest rate, they tend to be more feasible at that point in time because you don't need to worry about making those payments. Um, other than that, you know, again, it's completely up to you if you want to take out the equity in your home to help pay for your education. Um, I don't think that there's any tax benefits for that other than, you know, the normal benefits that you get for having the additional money out on your house. Mm -hmm. uh, I do normally recommend against it just for, again, those reasons that I said. But, you know, if you feel that that is your best opportunity, I would say go ahead and go for it. Okay, and uh, this actually might, this next question might actually be the last one that we can take uh, for the session this evening. Um, so many great questions. Uh, this one's from Rohan. Um, are there schools for which an application for aid impacts your admissions decision? So is, are, are those two completely separate things, or can aid, your need for aid, impact your admissions decision? And uh, perhaps this one is for Janelle. To my knowledge, your need or financial requirement to attend a university should not impact the admissions decision that is made by an institution. I've never come across that in my years of working in higher education. So okay. I hope that answers your question adequately. It should not come into consideration making an admissions decision. And if I can fill one item in really quick, actually the FAFSA remains in the hands of the financial aid people. Mm -hmm. uh, admissions is actually not able to review the FAFSA. Um, we can give them specific information so that they can make decisions on scholarships and things like that. But when it comes to them actually seeing your income and how much you make, the, the admissions staff, uh, it's against FERPA regulation for the admissions staff to actually see all the results of your FAFSA. So you can, be, you can feel very safe in knowing that when they are making that decision, they're not taking a look at your FAFSA and trying to make that decision based off of that information. Okay, well, Rohan, I hope that answers your question. And with that, I think we're going to have to conclude tonight's webinar. But I actually have a question for our, for our guests, which is, you know, I saw many, many great uh, questions coming in during this session that we unfortunately didn't have time to address. Are there ways for uh, the Beat the GMAT community members to reach out to the WP Carry team uh, with these questions? Absolutely. If, if anybody has something to write down our phone number right now, they can contact us at our phone number, which is 480-965-3332. That's the general phone number for the WP Carey School of Business MBA program. And our front desk team will be able to transfer you to the appropriate staff member. All right, and I uh, also want to remind folks that uh, the WP Carry program also is represented in our MBA Watch directory. So uh, we have uh, some, some eyes on that comment wall. If you have some questions there, uh, that may also be a great alternate place to, to uh, post some questions uh, after this session. So uh, we've been listening to Janelle McClelland, who is a member of the admissions and recruiting team at Arizona State University's WP Carey School of Business, as well as Karen Winters, who manages uh, the MBA Financial Services Office at that same program. Uh, they just walked us through a really, really great and helpful presentation about how we can go about financing our MBA degrees. I hope that you learned a lot. I sure did. And uh, you know, with that, I think uh, we're going to end tonight's session. So a huge thank you, Janelle and Karen. Thank you guys so much for spending your evening with us. Thank you for having us. Okay, and uh, also to our audience members, uh, appreciate your time in, uh, in coming out to, to learn about this very important topic. Uh, after the session, I also recommend that you check out some of the resources and, and program descriptions at wpcarry.asu.edu. It's a really great website and a really great uh, blog. And also I see lots of cool events coming up in the near future, uh, chats and uh, other uh, similar kinds of informational sessions. So take a look at that schedule. And uh, we hope that we can do these kinds of sessions again in the future. I think we do have other webinar opportunities coming up in the future uh, with WP Carry. So 
uh, we hope we see you as an audience member in those sessions as well. So best of luck to you all and good luck with your admissions and we'll talk to you soon.